but we won't be um, sharing the Q&A session afterwards. So it's just really the presentation that both Marco and... Sorry? So if just everybody could mute themselves. Okay. Perfect. I think should be fine now. Um, so welcome everybody to today. I'm so happy to welcome you and also to start off our series of thematic workshops within this circular economy and um, in collaboration with the Swiss Triple Impact Program. And um, today with us we have from the Circular Hub, Marco, who will then provide you with an introduction into the circular economy and Patrick from Semadeni Plastics Group who will give you a first-hand insight into practical implementation. So just to give you an overview or like a context, um, B Lab Switz or B Lab is an international NGO that has um, different offices around the world and is trying or establishing how businesses can be more sustainable and provide um, a solution or a plan how to reach the SDGs and the Agenda 2030. And in light of this, B Lab Switzerland has launched this year officially in September the Swiss Triple Impact Program. And within the Swiss Triple Impact Program, we are trying to aim and um, activate the Swiss economy and different SMEs to be part of this goal of reaching the agenda 2030 and providing a framework under which SDGs can be implemented and translated into each other or each um, business model. Today, our goals for our workshop are providing you with an introduction that Marco will um, give you to the circular economy as a concept and as a theory. Patrick will then come in and provide you with examples firsthand how um, circular economy can be implemented and what works and what doesn't. In the end, we'll have time to answer any open questions that you might have, and please feel free to use the chat function to add any questions that you might have throughout the session, and I can then gather them and collect them. Or, of course, you can also raise them yourself at the end of our session. So, um, as I mentioned, our plan is to start with the introduction, the practical examples, and then the discussion and Q&A. I would now give over to Marco with his introduction into the circular economy in Switzerland. Welcome. Perfect. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for your introduction, Jessica. Um, honestly, I was expecting like a British accent and I was preparing something, but you nope. know, <laughs> so we're moving back to the Swiss accent. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, yeah, nice to see everyone online. Um, I'm Marco. I'm like the academy lead of Circular Hub. And we see ourselves as kind of like the open knowledge and network platform when it comes to circular economy in Switzerland. So next slide, please. Um, as we can do, as we can't do it ourselves, we're also like part of a broader network that's for example, also like um, Circular Economy Switzerland, which has officially launched last week as well. Um, I think last Thursday, if I'm not mistaken, um, we're writing articles for the Circular Economy um, Entrepreneurs Club. And we're also like part of the um, network of Swiss Triple Impact. And I'm really glad to be here today with you. Um, next slide. <laughs> so when I was preparing this workshop, I saw this one slide from Kirchherr with kind of like, or he says that there are 114 definitions of a circular economy. And I thought that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of boring. And I don't want to show that to you. I think you have heard about it already. So I kind of like want to briefly take you through like the current challenges we face, um, then also kind of like look what we would like consider as circular economy, give some practical insights as well, some like business model examples, and then at the end show you kind of like 
what Circular Hub does as well and how we might be able to support you or your project. Next slide. <laughs> so here are the current challenges. And I think you hear a lot about like biodiversity laws, you hear a lot about climate change and stuff like that, but it's all kind of like interrelated, right? And I think at the end, the, the goal should be kind of like having a CO2 neutral economy. And when you look at the current pathway, it's kind of like would even even out. If we if you look at historical trends, it would go even higher. But we should like really try to go to this like 1.5 Celsius degrees pathway to like reduce them and yeah, come towards this like CO2 neutral uh, neutral economy. Next slide. So, and here you kind of see the benefits of a circular economy. Um, like of a, a huge part is also kind of like this green energy transition. And this can like make up, up to 55% towards the reduction of greenhouse um, gases. But we also have to kind of like think about what do we do with like products, with food and, and other resources. And I think here like, the circular economy can play a huge role as well. So for example, by designing out waste and pollution, we could reduce um, greenhouse gas em emissions. We could like keep the product in use for an even longer time and, and yeah, like keep the energy which we have put into like producing them. I will tell you a bit more later on. And then we could also kind of like regenerate natural system and like store the CO2 in soils and forests. And I think that's kind of like the basic or like the overview of a circular economy. And we would define it, um, next slide, Jessica, sorry. <laughs> I think, so when, when you hear about like circular economy, it's kind of like this whole, we, or we have to transform this whole economy, right? And like transforming a whole or like an entire economy might be quite cumbersome. So therefore we would go with this like definition of circularity. And here we would say kind of like, okay, it's kind of like an approach to keep resources for as long and as possible at the highest value um, in the system. And when we refer to resources, we also refer to products on the one side, but we also refer to like um, human labor kind and and so on. So I think that's quite important for us um, because like with this definition, we can start immediately and we do not have to wait till the entire economy has shifted towards a circular economy. So these are kind of like the two differences we would say. If you go one slide further. <laughs> so I think here you'll kind of like see on the left side how a linear economy looks like. So you extract resources, you manufacture them, you produce a good, you, you actually sell it. And you see kind of like this pre-use phase is rather long, but then the use phase is super short. So after using it for a short time, you just throw it away. And then all the like, all the energy is which you have put into manufacturing this product and using it is kind of lost. So, and if you look on the right side, you have this kind of circular approach. So it's still extracted at the beginning, then you manufacture something and you then like sell it or you maybe lease it as well. But what you can see here already is kind of like the use phase will extend because like you can actually, or the goal is kind of like to find business models where you can keep the product in use all the, all the time. And so thereby you can maybe like have it or this person can own it for a certain time then that goes to the next one. If you can't like sell it like in its original purpose anymore, you try to like remanufacture it or refurbish it. And then it goes back and closes all these cycles. And so thereby you can actually keep the resources in, in the whole system and the energy which you have put in as well. 
So if we go one slide further, I want to show you some kind of like practical like examples um, according to these kind of like three steps, like the pre-use step, the use phase, and the post-use phase. So for example, Wasser by Wasser, I don't know if anyone has heard of them already, but um, I think it's a quite a big thing in, in Zurich already. So they're taking like a sustainable resource, which is water in this example, Sorry, I can hear myself twice. Um, yeah, I think better now. Perfect. Um, take water, for example, and sell it in restaurants, and thereby they have created kind of like this business model and, and the revenue model as well. If we go to the next slide, we have an example in the use phase. So here it's really about trying to like extend the use time of, of this one product. And Signify is um, this one like branch of, of Philips as well. And so here it's super interesting. For example, the um, airport in, in Amsterdam, they have kind of like this, this, this contract, right? So the airport is not buying the bulbs anymore, but they're actually like paying for the service of lighting. And so like Signify takes care of all like the maintenance, they make sure, or they actually wanted to make sure as well, kind of like that their life bulbs are like lasting way longer than they used to. Um, I think there was in like 1934 or something, this like contract that light bulbs could like last only for a certain amount of, of hours. And then they have to like break down. And here, because they are actually like offering this service, they try to really try to make sure kind of like that its products are lasting for as long as possible and that they have as little effort as possible to kind of like maintain them, take it out, replace it, and so on. And then of course, if, it, if one bulb breaks, they take it back and they have all the like system and then they can create something new out of it. Um, if we go to the next slide, we have an example in the post use um, model. And here, that's a Swiss example, it's from Eberhard, um, which is quite interesting because kind of like, to, or till a couple of years ago, kind of like it was super interesting that, or it's actually still interesting because like the, the building owner might have to pay for kind of like demolishing the whole um, apartment or house or like site. And then Eberhard would, take it back as well and is like is having the, the material right or like is owning then the material as well and now they kind of like created this whole it's like AI driven as well and it, I think it will go into like force next year and then they will sort everything and create new products out of it as well like recycled concrete for example. Another example here from Philips would be kind of like um, it's x-ray machines right so you would like sell them maybe in a first market, they would take it back, refurbish them, and could sell it in a second market again, or even lease it. So thereby they would kind of like keep the ownership over its product. Um, yeah, if we go to the next slide, um, we, when, or like, when, when we give these kind of courses or like, um, like presentations, we, we always want to kind of like refer to the challenges to circulate as well. And interesting enough, it's kind of like these challenges are quite similar to the ones when it comes to innovating. So you always have this challenge of culture. You might have a challenge of regulation. The market might be not ready or no one is willing to pay for its product. Um, you have like the challenge of technology maybe, and you might face kind of like the challenge of education. Um, the interesting thing is kind of like, we also give these kind of like one day presentations and, and workshops and there we always invite experts. And the last couple of times, everyone or like all the experts said actually kind of like, it's not a challenge of technology, the technology is already existing. It's more a challenge of the mindset, of, of the current mindset. Um, I think there we kind of like need more use cases. We have to like show or yeah, kind of like present 
the benefits of a circular economy in, in a way that every manager understands and totally grasps, grasps the benefits and that it just makes sense. And, and I think that's one of our, um, one of our jobs as well at Circular Hub. If you go to the next slide, Jessica. We, we try to kind of like, yeah, master the transition with you. And it's, we have to bring everyone on board and then master it all together. And one, on the one side, we do it by offering this like online magazine. If you go into the next slide. So here, for example, it's kind of like, it's a lot about inspiring like managers, inspiring like users, inspiring like employees from all kind of like levels and so on. And we do that by kind of like having these use cases where we write about circular economy, ask companies kind of like how they have done the transition, how have they, they managed it. Um, we also offer you kind of like our favorite reading lists and, and podcasts as well. And I think that's just something, yeah, cool because you have it in, in one thing and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, if we go to the next slide, we, then you can see kind of like, for us, it's also a lot about empowering people. And I think that's super important when it comes to circular economy. You have to empower like um, employees or actors along the whole value chain, um, because it's not something you can do by yourself. And we try to do that by offering these public courses as well and so on. Um, and yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's it. And then if you go to the next slide, kind of like when you have this common ground established, it's also kind of a lot about um, building solutions based on this common ground. And here, what we have experienced as well is kind of like, it's super important that you have top management um, support as well um, but it's also super important that kind of like everyone in the company kind of like knows what you're talking about it's not just like oh you have to reduce that 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 it's more like hey by doing or implementing that we could do that and then kind of like go towards this like co2 neutral um, economy and I think that's really motivating as well, what we experience. And for example, in this, um, this photo, you can see a group of people, they have like implemented in the group strategy and they have, yeah, um, invited like many, many people from, from different areas and they have built together like ideas and now they're trying to, um, yeah, make, make use of them and implement them as well. Um, if you go to the second, yeah, or oh, second last slide already. Um, we, here we also see kind of like ourselves as that we have to go and, and learn and experience what is going on in, in the market. So therefore Marlus has also like launched Modaster Switzerland. Uh, maybe some of you have heard about it already, but it's one of the projects which we which Marlus is running as well. And we're like closing the whole cycle by feeding these learnings back to the like magazine, feeding it back to the academy, feeding it back to kind of like when it comes to implementation and just share these, these learnings and like, experiences as well. Because like we, we want to accelerate this, this transition. I think by doing that, we can help you as well. Um, I think that's the last slide here. Or second last slide, um, here you just see like our whole portfolio again. It's inspire, it's sensibilizing and informing, it's em empowering, it's implementing together with you, and it's like pilot and scale and feed these learnings back all in the circle again. Um, and on the last slide, you can see our team, our small team. We're a team of six. Um, and yeah. That was it. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, and thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Marco, for this great introduction to the topic of circular economy. We'll go on. Any questions that you might have, we'll be able to answer those in the end. 
So next up would be Patrick from um, Semandini Plastics. Good afternoon, everybody. Before we start, let me give you some uh, information on the company I represent. We're a medium-sized plastic converter with sites uh, in a few European countries too. Uh, we mainly are active in two areas. One is consumer good packaging, obviously an area with a high environmental relevance. And then the second area is, is a healthcare and the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I'm gonna show you how you can put circular economy into practice on a at shop floor level to give you some ideas, some insights, how we can uh, translate the goals from the uh, circular economy right down to the shop floor level. Next slide, please. Well, um, we have to be aware of that uh, there is a great, uh, great connection between circular economy and the sustainable development goals, the SDGs. Myself, I'm a huge fan of the SDGs. I think it's the most important and best plan for humanity and the planet. And so doing circular economy will support a number of the SDGs. I selected a few, the 6, 12, 13, 14, 15, uh, mainly uh, uh, covering uh, lands, air, clean water, and, and also responsible consumption and production. So uh, all the examples I will show you, they will always support at least one of those SDGs. Next slide, please. So um, as we heard from Marco, uh, one important uh, uh, concept of circular economy is to keep products and materials, not only materials, but also the products in a closed loop. So if we keep them in a closed loop, they are not entering the environment and creating pollution. In plastics, for instance, you all know those uh, shocking pictures of seas, of beaches, completely polluted with plastic packaging. And uh, that can be avoided if we manage to keep those products in a loop, uh, which is not the case. Most of this pollution occurs in Southeast Asia, so uh, there's a lot to do in terms of circularity of waste management, uh, even though over there in those countries. But still, in Switzerland, we have a littering rate of 0.7%, which is even 0.7% too much. Next slide, please. Then, of course, if we uh, refuse products because they're not necessary, for instance, over packaging, if we reuse and finally recycle those products and the materials, less raw material has to be produced and less products have to be manufactured. Of course, this will reduce resource consumption and we do have a problem with resource consumption. Just to remind you, the Earth's overshoot day this year was on 22nd of August. That means that until 22nd of August, we used up all the resources that the planet can regenerate in one year. So right now we're reducing the resources of the planet. So if we continue like this, we won't have any resources soon in the future. Next slide, please. Okay, and then of course, uh, our biggest environmental problem, which of course is the climate change. Not everyone understands this, unfortunately, but it is very dramatic what this will create in the near future. So if we do circular economy, we use less resources, less raw materials, less uh, new products. Of course, we need uh, less energy, which will result in a lower greenhouse gas emission uh, at the end of the day. So circular economy is very beneficial for the uh, for climate action to prevent or to uh, reduce the effects of the climate change. Next slide, please. So it's very important if you are thinking of uh, how can I put circular economy into practice in my organization. Uh, some of you come from a production company, some of you from a service company, some of you from uh, administration, 
from, I don't know what corner you come all from, but very different uh, backgrounds. Anyway, uh, wherever you come from, it's important to use a systematic approach. And here, the STI Action Manager. By the way, uh, we participate in the STI program and uh, we are very enthusiastic about it. It's a very good program that helps very much uh, attaining the goals of the SDGs and also helping to put circular economy into practice. So uh, if you use the STI Action Manager, it will also guide you through all those questions and help you to apply a systematic approach. So uh, what you have to do, or what I suggest you to do, is to use that approach to identify all areas where you resources are consumed. So uh, most of you will probably work in, a, in an office, not outside, so that means you're working in a building. So a building consumes resources, of course, at the time when the building is constructed, during the operation of the building, heating, lighting, all those stuff. So uh, a lot of resources are related to the building where you're working in. Then if you are a production company, then you use machines. Any kind of equipment, machinery uh, that will consume resources. It's not only energy, it's water, it's uh, oil, greases, lubricants, all kind of uh, uh, other um, I just had a question, but um, I, I will come to that later on. Yeah, I saw it in the chat. Uh, Jessica, you can remind me after the presentation on the question, yeah. So uh, machines will also uh, take up resources, identify them. And even if we don't operate machines, uh, all of us, we have a PC, a notebook, we have a smartphone. Sometimes we still print out something. Um, etc. So all these are also resources that are being used. Then, uh, of course, all the question of uh, traveling, which is in the pandemic a little bit less uh, less uh, on the top of the agenda. But um, if I uh, think of myself, I had around 60 flights per year. And if we know how much uh, a CO2 is produced by a flight, it's enormous. So that's definitely something to work on, to have less flights, to reduce flying and to use uh, like virtual meeting systems just as we do today and the pandemic showed us that it works very well so there is a huge uh, impact on a, on a circularity also if you reduce traveling and also the commuting how are your colleagues coming to work going back home after work packaging materials of course that also uh, contains all um, envelopes that can contain uh, packages, cardboard, glass, plastic, everything. And even marketing, uh, you probably all have giveaways. Uh, that can be uh, maybe some just cheap ballpoint pen that you import from China. If you make the CO2 footprint or you establish the CO2 footprint, you will find this to be a not very sustainable uh, giveaway. So maybe also look at this area to find circularity. And then also the canteen, how you, um, how you uh, provide food for your, uh, your uh, colleagues. Then the, I think the philosophy is to really, to uh, the concept is to look at solutions to use less material. And if you have to use materials, sustainable materials, uh, namely recycled materials or reusable materials and close the loops wherever possible. Next slide, please. I'll give you here a very nice example. Uh, what you see on the picture on the left side are old discarded fishing gear. Fishing gear, it's uh, nets and ropes. Those days, all those uh, nets and ropes are made of polyolefins, that is polyethylene and polypropylene, it's plastics. So after a certain time, those nets are not usable anymore. So instead of uh, discarding them or even littering them into the seas, uh, they can be collected and they can be converted into new plastics. 
these are pictures I took in Denmark from a company that uh, does this. We work with them. And what they produce is uh, that green material that we then convert to packaging and that are being used uh, in this case for this uh, Meerschutz cream. It's a skin, uh, skin cream that is being uh, marketed by the company Provin. It's a German company. So the, the, the converter of the plastic nets or the, who recycles those plastic nets, it's a company in Denmark. And uh, they are part of a program that is called SCG Accelerated Program, a program that has been set up by UNDP in uh, Copenhagen that also supports quite a few of the SDGs. And it's a shining example how you can use a waste stream, avoid uh, that those fishing nets are being discarded because you can't even incinerate them and use the energy value because the fishing nets, they will damage the, the equipment, the incineration equipment. So uh, they're either discarded in the sea or they are being landfilled. So no environmental uh, uh, value whatsoever can be retained. But uh, with the system mm. that this company applies, uh, turning them into a new plastics, we can really uh, keep them in the loop. So that's a very nice uh, example. And they have calculated that they can save 1.65 ton of uh, CO2 equivalents by using one ton of this material instead of virgin material of petrochemical use. So we even have a negative CO2 equivalent effect, which is very important if we want to reach the Paris climate uh, uh, agreement goals. So an STI pledge, uh, in our case, uh, one of the pledges we uh, made uh, for the STI program is that we want to increase the use of recycled plastics in our products by a certain percentage year by year. That means that we uh, uh, increase our offer and we try to switch customers from using petrochemical raw materials to recycled raw materials and generating uh, CO2 equivalent savings which is very important in, in view of the climate change. Next slide, please. Okay, another example how we can use uh, recycled plastic, uh, recycled materials, we have a catalog that is about five or 600 pages. And uh, last year for the first time, we used recycled paper to print this catalog. Although the marketing department, they said, oh, the pictures are not as bright anymore, we can't do that, etc. Uh, we still do it because it's more important to be sustainable than to have the brightest pictures. So what we do is we really hope that uh, the consumers will also uh, 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 honor this by accepting less bright marketing materials, but recognizing that they do something good for the environment by using this. So we can keep the all the paper in the loop. And uh, we will, from now on, print all or do all printed matter with recycled materials, all, no matter what it is. And that's something everyone, a service company has printed matter and being business cards or whatever, you can always use recycled paper. Next slide, please. Okay, another thing uh, we can do and we have to do as industry is we have to design products in a way so that they can be kept in the loop. So uh, one thing, it's not on the slide, it's the obsolescence. Uh, you all know that you have a product that does not last long, that by on purpose not lasts long, so the company manufacturing the products can sell a new one. So uh, we definitely have to avoid this. We have to design products and to uh, develop products in a way that they last the longest possible. We have always done this. It's like if you have an engineering background, this is normal. But we see a lot of products that are cheap. They don't last long, but in the end, they cost more. And if you take in the uh, external environmental costs, they even cost a lot more. So what we can do, especially in terms of packaging, uh, we can design the products in a way they can be easily recycled. And for that, we have co-founded the Allianz Design for Recycling Plastics. It's uh, 
stakeholder-based initiative uh, where the whole value chain, so we have all the brand owners, we have uh, uh, the retailers, uh, we have companies like Nestle, Unilever in this alliance, uh, for instance, big corporates, and we have converters in there, and we have uh, uh, defined a set of, of criteria uh, we have to follow when we uh, develop a new packaging. So the new packaging will be easily recyclable. So this is very important for all new uh, developments, and that means that uh, we won't have the most brightest, the most uh, shining product in the in the on the shelf, but we will maybe have a, a product that is grayish, but it will be made of recycled products and it will be easily recyclable again. So that's very important. That's something we can do in terms of designing the products. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, Reuse. Reuse is a very important uh, issue. Um, we have a lot of single-use products in the marketplace, so we have to think, uh, can we replace single-use uh, with reuse? So uh, we took a stake in a, in a Recircle Germany. Maybe you know the company Recircle. They uh, have bowls, reusable bowls, that are handed out by the takeaways where you can get food, restaurants or takeaway stands. So you pay like a fee, you get the bowl, and you get the feedback when you give back the bowl. The bowl is then cleaned and uh, used for the next uh, meal. Or you can keep the bowl, clean it yourself, and bring it uh, to your takeaway stand. And you can bring it to any takeaway or stand or restaurant that has a takeaway service that participates in the recircle system. Uh, in Switzerland, they won the Swiss Economic uh, uh, Forum Award. And in Germany, we're just in full development and we have a very nice development, a lot of new restaurants joining. And that's a shining example how we can uh, replace all that single use uh, 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 plates and single use bowls and also knives and forks and whatever. And we can uh, bring in place a, a reuse system. So this is really a, a circular economy at its best. So uh, SDI Pledge, and that's when SDI Pledge of our company too, is that we, uh, where we have single-use products, most of our products are already uh, uh, reused, but we still have some single-use products, and we want to offer our customers a reuse option. And sometimes this is not very easy, so next slide, please. You all know those syringes on the left, Side, you see the what you know from uh, the medical cabinet, you see from the hospital, all those single-use um, um, syringes. And that's when I, uh, I had uh, the opportunity to have a dinner with uh, Sarah Wingstrand from Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And uh, she advocated reuse over single-use. And I said, Sarah, I understand this, but how, how you want to manage this with medical products? Take syringes, for instance it just doesn't exist on the marketplace. And then she showed me a picture and gave me a contact and said, yes, it does, look here. And uh, so we contacted this company and we found, uh, effectively, we found a reusable syringe. That's what you see on the right side, the picture. Looks a little bit like a, like a Frankenstein, uh, I don't know, it looks a bit scary. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, that's the way the, those syringes look. The, I don't know, 100 years ago, but we will take this up in our uh, uh, range and offer the customer this option. So uh, we, of course, have, uh, it has to be environmentally more, more beneficial, beneficial, because if you uh, are in the medical sector, it's uh, kind of difficult to uh, have reusable products because uh, we have all that hygiene uh, issues, you have to clean, to decontaminate, to sterilize them again. Those are all processes that take a lot of energy, a lot of chemicals. So really the uh, medical cabinet, the hospital or whatever, they have to make a life cycle assessment. And if they are equipped and everything is in place and they manage to, uh, to have a, a LCA-based, more beneficial, uh, uh, reusable uh, product use, then they have the possibility with us to purchase this product instead of the single-use product. 
Next slide, please. Then also increasing the lifespan. If you uh, look at those pallets, you have a wooden pallet and you have a plastic pallet. So the first thought will be, uh, well, the wooden pallet is more sustainable, of course, because it's wood. The other thing is plastic. No, it's not true. Because the plastic, uh, the wooden pallet will make about eight to 10 turnarounds and then it's damaged in a way you can't fix it. So it's being thrown away and burned. A plastic pallet can take up to 150 to 200 turnarounds and then it can still be regrinded and used for another new pallet. So it's much more circular to use a plastic pallet instead of a wooden pallet. And on top of that, the wooden pallet weighs 25 kilograms, while the plastic pallet has only 19.5 kilograms. So if you think of a, a truck or even a train, loaded with pallets, it adds some more weight if you use wooden pallets, and that again means higher greenhouse gas emissions. So things uh, are not always the way they look at first sight. We really have to go make a life cycle assessment, and uh, so increasing lifespan is definitely an important thing for circularity too. Next slide, please. Then we are a production company. What you see here on the right side uh, is our injection molding machines. Basically, they work in a way that uh, you melt the plastic uh, pellets, then you inject them with high pressure into the cavity of a mold. Then you uh, have to cool it down so that you can demold and you can eject the part, the finished plastic part. So you need energy on one hand to melt that. Uh, plastic, that's endothermal, and then when you cool the product, you have an exothermal process. So that means a process that gives heat. So uh, what's important, what you can do with circularity is you can use that heat, that process heat, for heating purposes of your building, and that's exactly what we do. So we have, a, a if you want, a circularity with the process heat because you use this for heating your buildings. And also the cooling water, we do all that cooling in the mold uh, using water. So uh, you can either use fresh water or you can use a, a closed water, water circuit, and that's what we do. So we also close the loop with the fresh water. So we use less fresh water. So if we translate this again, because uh, some of you are participant in the STI too, and some of you are even B Corps, uh, one of the pledge could be to reduce energy consumption by a certain amount of percent until. So we already did a 15% energy saving pledge that we already fulfilled. And uh, our pledge will be to use 100% uh, regenerative energy by 2030. So that's an SDI pledge we will apply. Next slide, please. Okay, another, another thing uh, we can do is uh, we can allocate our funds to sustainable projects. I showed you uh, the Recircle Germany project. That's where we decided to make investment only in circular projects. Uh, now, just a small example, but it can uh, it's a, it serves as a good example. Uh, we always gave away gifts to our top customers every Christmas. It was uh, something to consume, like a uh, uh, Lebkuchen. I don't know how you say this in English. It's something you can eat. And uh, we decided this year that uh, we can use these funds to uh, do something more circular, more more sustainable. And uh, this year we decided to uh, allocate the fund, it's 5,000 Swiss francs, and to give this money to the Interessensgemeinschaft Saubre Umwelt, IGSU. Uh, what they do is they uh, organize cleanups, and uh, we contacted our, com our uh, municipality, Ostermundigen, and we told them, uh, look, we would like to uh, finance some lit cleanup projects. In your in your community and so uh, what they do they do cleanups they do uh, also workshops in schools 
to really uh, sensibilize the, 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 the kids uh, not to litter their, their, their packagings or whatever, or even also their aluminum cans or whatever. So uh, we can also use the funds we used for uh, non-sustainable uh, activities for sustainable activities. Next slide. Okay, so there were, those were the concrete examples. Uh, there are many, many further other examples that you can also uh, implement in, in, a, in, in view of the uh, SCI program or B Corp program. Of course, separate waste collection and recycling, then uh, usage of recyclates. I showed you examples. Uh, use less products in materials. If you have a product, you can always look, uh, do I need that much? Uh, uh, material can I use maybe a flexible packaging with only one third of the plastics or whatever material in there then uh, um, sometimes you have also to look at the disruptive business models and that's where really the SCI program helps because it, it opens your mind for new uh, new uh, business models that are more uh, sustainable but maybe totally dis disruptive uh, compared to what you're doing today. So open your mind, uh, take uh, Elon Musk uh, uh, point of view and really uh, think in systems, not in products. Uh, what are your products doing? And maybe there are different ways to, to achieve what your product does uh, by being disruptive. Then all the biofeedstock uh, question, we can look at biofeedstock. Of course, a uh, biofeedstock uh, that does not compete with the food chain. Uh, we don't want to see this. We don't want to use biofeedstock that uh, can be used for nutrition purposes. We will uh, compromise SDG 1 and 2 by doing so. But there are still a lot of waste stream. Half of the, of the mass that we incinerate today is, is of biological origin. It's biomass. So if we manage to use this biomass, to create new raw materials, that would be a huge step forward. And uh, it can be even CO2 negative if we can uh, use that biomass to use new, to make new products. Okay, um, then uh, maybe, um, yeah, just uh, all those closing the loops. I mentioned a lot of uh, uh, examples and there are many more, so this is of course from the point of view of a manufacturing company from industry as a service company, as a, a public uh, administration, maybe you have other, uh, other, uh, other aspects uh, or other uh, areas where it do have an impact on, the, on, on circularity. And finally, what I can really say is that the SCI program uh, offers the perfect framework to do so and the methodolo methodology. So it's really a fantastic program. I'm totally enthusiastic about it. It's, uh, and I invite all of you who are not part of it to participate at an introduction workshop where you will learn more about uh, the SDGs also and how you can translate them into your daily business. Because uh, we are running out of time, we have a serious, environmental problems, namely the climate change. We know about it for decades, but we don't do much so far. So we really have to increase action, to increase fast, to act fast. And the SCI program is really an excellent program to onboard as many companies as possible. And uh, we really need the help of all of you to, on this journey to onboard as many people, as many businesses as possible. Okay, so that was my uh, my part, my examples. So uh, Jessica, there was a question, maybe you could show yeah. it for me. So thank you very much for your great presentation. I think everybody got a really good insight into what there are, what examples there are of implementing circular economy in various contexts. So the question was, can you give us a comparison of 0 0.7 littering rates in, for example, how many tons that would be or waste? How can we imagine 0.7% of littering? Okay, in uh, Switzerland, we have a total of 780,000 tons of plastic waste. 780,000 tons. So the littering rate of 0.7% could, 
uh, comes about to five to five thousand five hundred tons a year. Perfect. And just to give you another another figure, if you go to Vietnam, for instance, those are the worst uh, globally. They have a rate of 88% of mismanaged waste and littering. Mismanaged waste means waste that enters the environment. So it's really, we have a huge problem in Southeast Asia. Economies are growing at a tremendous pace and they don't, uh, they don't have any waste management systems uh, that can keep pace with that. So um, I think uh, also in uh, in uh, in all the development uh, policies, uh, we should really uh, maybe also support those countries in uh, in terms of uh, waste management, not only food programs, waste management, and of course uh, we have to educate people. That's the second most important. Well-educated people will be more environmental conscious and also more, more social sensible. Perfect, thank you. And so I would open up the floor to any questions that you might have. So there is one. The next one would be, what software or tools do you recommend to do the LCA and what impact assessment methods do you use? I tried to learn on this, thank you. Okay, there are standards for uh, LCA. I don't remember the name, but there's uh, ESO standards. And uh, when we do LCA, we don't do them ourselves because we don't have the expertise. We use, a, uh, for instance, a company like Carbotech. Carbotech, uh, there's also freeware you can download on the internet. Uh, if you're interested, I can, uh, I can give you more information on that. Uh, you can send me an email. Uh, Jessica can then give you, uh, because I don't have your direct contact, uh, I can give you those contacts if you're interested in uh, by email contact. Perfect. Um, is there another? Perfect. Uh, does anybody else have another question? Specific? Yeah, just add something um, to, to your to, to, to the previous question. Kind of like, um, I mean, I think LCA is, is a really good thing, and we do not have the expertise as well. We we try to do it with someone else. But um, this summer, I attended like the program from to delft in the netherlands where it was about like circular circularity calculator and hotspot mapping and it's kind of an, an another approach but super interesting as well when you try to find out what you could improve on your product therefore worth having a look yeah maybe just another uh, uh, information um uh, that may be uh, sound a little weird now uh, if we have a webinar on circular economy but there are certain cases where circular economy is not sustainable. Um, and I'll give you the, two examples. Uh, one example is uh, you, have a, um, you have an old car, for instance, a car that is 10 years old. And uh, now you can, uh, uh, you can uh, recycle this car, the materials of this car, uh, if it breaks, or you can, you can refurbish it, you can uh, repair this car to make another 10 years. But then, of course, if you look at the CO2 uh, footprint of that car, um, it does not respond to uh, the requirements of today. So uh, in this case, it's much better to uh, recycle the materials uh, that are in this car and to uh, either uh, use no car anymore to share the car like mobility uh, or something like that. Or uh, if it's a car, then uh, maybe use a small electrical cars like a Renault Zoe or something like that. And the second thing is uh, you may have a, a, a substances of concern in your products that uh, have not been of concern 10 or 20 years ago. So uh, in, especially in buildings where you may tear down a building that is uh, like 50 years old or even more, you might have plastic, uh, uh, plastic parts that have uh, like uh, heavy metals or, or other uh, additives that today are not allowed anymore, that are banned, but at the time were not banned. So uh, you don't wanna have them in your uh, waste stream, you don't wanna have them in your recycling stream. So it's much better to have those in, uh, to incinerate them and to retain at least the, the, the caloric value and to use this for heating purposes. So there are certain cases where circularity is not sustainable 
And uh, if you are more interested in that, you can go to uh, the website of ETH Zurich. They have a project that is called Clean Cycle of Dr. Melanie Haupt. And that's exactly uh, what, uh, what they're working at, to determine indicators to, uh, to find out when is circularity really from an environmental point of view, the best solution. There were other questions, Jessica. So, um, no, Davita just shared companies in Switzerland that specialize in LCAs for everybody. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, common knowledge. Um, yeah, please post your questions or you can also bring them up yourself. Maybe in the meantime, I can also ask to bring it back to maybe recommendations. If a smaller SME doesn't know where to start and is overwhelmed with all of the different things they need to um, identify, what would your recommendations be? Where should they start with all of the things they have to do? Well, they should contact BLAP. <laughs> exactly, <Of course. laughs> become part of the STI. <laughs> or Circular Hub, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, First of all, they need to uh, to um, they need to uh, get the right mindset. They need to be aware of the environmental problems we are and to recognize them. So uh, we don't want anybody to do some greenwashing and oh, well, we have to do something for the yeah to satisfy this uh, this zeitgeist. No, you really have to take a systematic approach. You have to go through all the sustainability. And it's not only the environmental questions, it's also all the social questions. It's gender equality, it's inclusion, non-discrimination, all those questions. Because we have huge changes in society these days too. We are much more diverse than we were 10 years ago. So uh, we have new requirements there too. So sustainability is not only a circularity, it's much more. And I think uh, uh, really a good way is to participate in an introductory workshop of, uh, of uh, the Swiss Triple Impact Program, and then you get uh, you get an understanding of what all this encompasses, and uh, where the questions are, and then of course you have uh, at BLAB and that uh, for the SCI in the STI team, you have people like myself. I also work on the platform of Burn of the STI, uh, who can give practical advice where to start, and really to uh, take a systematic approach. And if you take the examples. Uh, they're so clear that everyone says, oh, yes, I have PCs. Oh, yes, I have this and this. And then you start to think. And my advice is to involve your team. Involve either your management team. What we did, we involved our management team first. And involve your uh, middle managers. Involve also uh, uh, your, your young people, reverse mentoring. Uh, you can make mixed teams. Uh, don't, don't just stick to the, to the hierarchies. Just take people from everywhere take young people because they're the future and it's important to learn the way how they think. So build mixed teams, contact STI, and then uh, you're in the right way. Thank you, Patrick. I think I, I couldn't agree more. Um, one, one additional point maybe from my side, as at the end of the day, like no one knows how, or there's no like perfect circular system. It's just like this, mm, huge mess I feel um, and you you like Ken Webster called it like closing the pipe but that does actually not work because yeah you can't always close it you will always have side streams so it's more like feeding the forest and like work with these side streams and you have to get involved with your whole value chain I feel learn what kind of like side streams they have um, learn kind of like what size views your competitors might have. Just learn from your peers and exchange and be open-minded and yeah, start a journey somewhere. Perfect, thank you both. So we had another question now from Catherine. For Patrick, um, do you as a plastics producer experiment with biodegradable products that could replace some of the plastic used in today's packaging? And do you notice increasing demand from your customers for those options? Well, thank you, Catherine, for this question. It's a very important question. Um, yes, we have some experience, but uh, we don't like biodegradables too much. And I give you the reasons why. Uh, first of all, uh, when we try to talk of circular economy, uh, we still have the material loop, meaning recycling. Uh, what we have to do there is to do design for recycling 
that we have to take out complexity. That means we have to reduce the number of polymers used and we have to have uh, the cleanest possible waste streams. The cleaner those waste streams are, or the purer, the better we can recycle them at a high rate. And then uh, uh, the better the products are we can make out of them. And the recycling is at the core of the European New Green Deal. It was at the core of the new plastic strategy that the Commission has uh, communicated in 2018. So the Commission wants 10 million tons of recyclates in uh, finished products by 2025 in Europe. And uh, all of Europe has approximately 50 million tons of plastic consumption. So 20% uh, of the plastics we, we uh, convert in the EU should be recyclates. So that's the aim of, uh, of the plastic strategy that has been repeated in the new Green Deal and in March 2020 in the Circular Economy Action Plan that the Commission has issued. Okay, so uh, if we have a, a bio-based plastics in, a, in those waste streams, it will compromise, it will be detrimental to, to recycling. And then uh, what does biodegradable mean? That is also a very important question. Uh, mostly it does degrade under certain conditions only. That means you need a certain uh, humidity, a certain temperature, you need oxygen to be present, you need microorganisms to be present, you need to have a certain pH level, uh, acid level, uh, that all those, uh, that, that bi biodegradability takes place. So uh, many, and, and there's a risk that many people think, oh, that's biodegradable, I just can throw that away anywhere in the environment. And then you don't have those conditions and it won't degrade. So it will persist in the environment and we have the, the, the contrary of what we want. So uh, the position of the commission, and I share this posi position, is that uh, for certain applications, yes, like maybe coffee capsules, or tea bags or stuff like that, it can be useful, but not uh, in a broad use. Uh, where I see a potential is when you can, uh, uh, maybe you know that the plastics are, are, are polymers. Polymers means it's long chains of molecules, very long chains. And they are built of so-called monomers. So you just polymerize all the monomers and then you get the long chains. And the monomers you can, uh, you can uh, gain them from, uh, from NAFTA, from, uh, from the petrochemical sources, but there are also possibilities to uh, use waste streams to generate those monomers that uh, chemically will be identical to the monomers you gain from NAFTA, and then the plastic is exactly the same. So that means you can recycle them, you can use them with food contact, and that's a way uh, that is very interesting and uh, there are plastics already on the marketplace. Uh, we will launch uh, soon laboratory bottles. It's not single use, but still, that will have 40% content uh, of uh, monomers that have been gained from uh, uh, waste from the food processing industry. So that is very circular too. And uh, that's a way where I see we can use the biomass, but bio biodegradable products it's a bit critical because they don't biodegrade in any environment. They really need a specific environment to degrade. And then uh, uh, we have the risk of false claims, false claims that people think they're doing something good for the environment and just throw that away. Uh, so that's a long answer to answer to a short question. Patrick, may I ask you something on, on that as well? I'm, I haven't found it yet, but I think you guys have, or like the Alliance for Recycling has um, posted this um, newsletter article um, or news article from New York Times where it's about like um, bio-based plastics. And I, th I think this one was super insightful. Maybe you can find it and share it with us if you know where it is. <laughs> yeah, I haven't read it, but I'm... Um, uh, okay, I'll, I'll find it then. <laughs> and send, I, it, to send Jessica. it to Jessica if I find it. Then. Or you can... Perfect. Okay, okay. Perfect, and I'll share it with everybody else. So thank you both again. Um, we haven't gotten any more questions. So um, I, think, I think we're coming to an end of our session. 
um, with having answered all the questions. I thank you both for taking your time and answering and giving us an introduction into this topic of circular economy. I think we got a great insight into how there isn't a right way to start. You just need to start and surround yourself with the tools and frameworks that can be useful, which among others can be the Swiss Triple Impact. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any further questions about the program, about B-Lab in general, and I'll be happy to help you. And um, please also, I'll send all of you the slides we had and if any other questions come up, just uh, reach out and I'll get you the answers that you're looking for or try at least. And I wish you all a great afternoon and hopefully I'll see you in another thematic workshop or the next introduction session. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Have a good one. You too, bye. Bye bye. bye. bye, -bye.